just check that we are here. Let's see. Refresh one more time. Here we are. We are live. Okay. Well, holy, holy cannoli. I am so excited, Lindsay, to have you here. Um, this is our very first episode of the magic show, the practical magic show. And I honestly, I couldn't think of a more perfect human being to have kick this off with me. I love you to death and you inspire me. And really I'm, I'm here to learn from you. And um, I introed you already, but I'll tell you who you are to me. Um, even sitting in front of me right now, you are like a mystical creature. Like you just, you have this sort of like primal and ethereal and magical and both like whimsical and provocative nature that just like, it just stirs something up in me. And it's partially scary, mostly exciting, very inspiring. And at the same time, you just radiate so much love and boldness and care for the people in your world that you have a relentlessness about you in ushering their authenticity to life. And I think what's so amazing to me about that is that in order to actually bring to life what you want, you have to go in to the unknown. And yet we try to control every element of bringing our desire to life. And you can't do that, right? Because in the infinite possibilities in front of you, you have to venture in outside of what's normal for you. And I think that for me, that's what excites me the most about you. Because as much as I love to create and dream big, like the unknown scares the shit out of me. And I'm like a constantly recovering control freak. <laughs> so... I think that you have so much, I am excited to learn from you in this conversation about what I perceive your magic trick to be, so to speak, is diving kind of with this reckless abandon into the unknown to bring stuff to life and in kind of pulling people toward you to do that. So that's who you are to me. And, and I guess who I'd introduce you as is that you're the, the creator, founder, and leader of the Dark Horse Initiative, which is just so you. And for those watching, the Dark Horse Initiative is a place for the best kept secrets to make their moves, come out of the shadows, and thrive. So thank you for being here. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction. Uh, I should pay you to follow me around and introduce me wherever we go. And what I love about having this conversation with you and what I'm so excited since we put it on the calendar, it's just been a highlight for me, is it's a conversation of many conversations that you and I have shared around magic and how that plays with mastery and where does practice come in and how do we make it practical and can't we just control things already and can't we just show up and make stuff happen because we're working really, really hard. And so I love um, that just getting to witness the evolution of both of us and our uh, friendship over the years. And then I think just this is just a natural expression, this conversation and um, with you. So I'm, I'm really excited to be here and I look forward to diving in. Yeah. And we don't know where we're going, really. And I, I told Lindsay this, but I have this, which says, I'm pretty sure I have no idea. And I think it's just the perfect kind of catalyst because we're going into the unknown. And so I guess I'll start with, you know, for me, the magic show, the practical magic show, I perceive you as magical in a certain way, but I really want to learn about magic in a way that you create in the world that I don't know about. And so I perceive your magic trick, so to speak, as really embracing the unknown. And I want to talk, I want to kind of start with what that actually means, but I'd love for you also to just loop in and bring in anything else. Because like I said, I'm here to learn from you. I'm here to evolve in my experience of magic and then we'll ground it in what actually how do we actually practice this um and i think something that you and i both really love and embrace is that while we love the world of exploration and personal development we both feel like you know sometimes there's like heads on balloons and we want to pull them back down to earth so why don't we start with you sharing 
what it means to you to, we hear that all the time to let go of control, surrender, embrace the unknown. Tell me what, what does that look like for you? How have you done that? And what has it created? You know, um, I love that we're starting here. And I love that in the introduction, you had used the words reckless abandon. And I love it because I don't necessarily own those words uh, for myself. And I think there's a key to embracing the unknown that can be really practical for people here. Um, What looks like from the outside looking in as reckless abandon is really inspiring and it's um, moving for any one of us. When I see you creating boldly or really anyone, there's this aspirational quality, but then we go, not really me. I don't think I could do that. Or maybe someday I can somehow figure that out. When it's not, as far as my experience, it hasn't been reckless abandon. It's like aligned boldness. And so when we look at it as aligned boldness, it opens up this whole new world of opportunity and possibility for any one of us to learn how to listen deeper, to notice deeper, and then to train differently and trained deeper and to be so aware of not only the obvious things happening around us, but also the subtlety of it, uh, the subtle energies, uh, the subtle things people say or don't say, uh, the space uh, of, of really raw possibility that then we know present moment by present moment, we get these insights of just the next step. And it becomes this willing boldness that I don't know how this is gonna go, but I'll just say yes to this next step because that step is doable. And then you string together those moments of alignment, attunement, and action over time. And I think that's where we get that outer view of like, oh my gosh, they're so courageous. They're so bold. They're so out there in the unknown and in the possibility of their life. Um, So I don't know if that, how that lands for you. Does that make sense? I hear you. And I'm just kind of laughing because I noticed this, <laughs> this element of me going, well, aligned boldness is not as sexy as reckless abandon. <laughs> but I think that's so perfect though, because when we look, and I love that distinction between what you see on the outside versus what you experience on the inside. And I think that you know, just kind of catching the difference in language there, it would be a lot more difficult to to fly into the unknown if flying into the unknown looks like reckless abandon versus I don't really know how this is going to play out, but something feels right that's pulling me to just take this next step and I don't know where that's going to lead next. And kind of viewing the unknown as one more step beyond what I can see versus this whole kind of like, almost like jumping to another planet and kind of being in this totally different realm. That's a very different experience. Yeah, it is. It's And, and I love, you can use the word reckless abandon all you want, Vanessa. Uh, but it, it, it is also like seeing the unknown as, as um, not scary. And there's a, there's a calibration that takes a little bit of finessing uh, and experiencing it. Um, to see it as less terrifying. Now, I still get fear. I still have fear. I still get uh, terrified out of my mind uh, of of trying something or putting myself out there or, um, gosh, even normal people stuff. Um, And, you know, it so it, that never goes away. But when you start to look at the the unknown, like wilderness, Uh, like pioneering, like exploring, uh, like stepping into this whole new realm, fear's not the reason why we don't step out then. It just becomes almost like this partner with us or uh, proof that we're on the path. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because if you look at the people that experience stage fright or nerves or, or any number of these things, they're doing things. 
and they're really expanding the boundaries of who they are and what some version of them in the past thought they were capable of. And um, I, I think that that just changes the whole game around fear, around challenge, around difficulty. It doesn't just become a struggle fest of suffering. And I hope we can last long enough to make it. Um, but it becomes this, you've used this phrase, the edge of your potential, going to the edge of the world and not sure you're going to come back and wanting that and saying yes. I might have stolen that phrase from you. <laughs> and then you. <laughs> but I think that you brought up something that I really, I think is super unique about you. And, and what I love, because you use the phrase, the wild frontier a lot. And I know that you live here in Colorado and that you, you kind of live more in the wild frontier and that you have a different relationship to the unknown, I think because of the way that you actually bring it into practicality, like you said, the actual wilderness, and you use the word you train differently. And I think that that language really highlights how you think differently about the unknown. Because when I think about the unknown, I'm literally thinking about just sort of this like vague, blank, no man's land in front of me. But it sounds to me like when you think about the unknown, you're drawing parallels to the literal wild frontier, to training differently. I know you talk a lot about like the way warriors train or athletic training. And so can you tell me a little bit more about how you can relate to the unknown from that perspective? Yeah. Um, and I love that you slowed down to challenge our definition because so much of the time we feel like we're speaking the same language, both wild frontier and unknown, um, but we see nuances and um, you know, one of the pieces around being in the unknown and seeing it as a wild frontier does come from being physically loving being in the wilderness and being close to um, the mountains and being um, a part of feeling kind of the rhythms and really even the truth, sometimes hard truth of the woods. And this parallel came up so strongly in 2020, especially because we had this snapshot where um, for the the known, um, the control mechanisms, the, the kind of the tried and true strategies really weren't working anymore. Uh, we really were. If anybody has like uh, post-traumatic stress around the word unprecedented and we think, uh that's like the whole of 2020 for us. And so when I say train differently, it's really this embracing and acknowledgement that we never had full control. That was always the illusion um, that tried and true ways <clears throat> are only as good as that kind of controlled artificial environment that allows them to happen. But as soon as there's a twist, as soon as there's an unexpected uh, turn in the path, all of that tried and true goes out the window. And I was really interested um, a number of years ago in looking at, well, then what remains? Uh, because it, in, I would try, I had this, I had this thing, I had this thing, this is a control freak in recovery, right? Where if I could figure out all of the right things to do, all the right ways to be, all the right things to say, then it would all work out for me and I would never really have to struggle. I just found that fundamentally didn't work. And I'm so glad now that it didn't because that's where I got curious of like, well, what is my piece of that? What can I train? How do I develop trust? That's not trust that everything's going to stay the same. It's trust that I can find center and I can find clarity uh, and I can stay in momentum through any change or challenge, just as if uh, we were on a physical expedition and we wouldn't know what's around the next curve and what dangers await. We'd really have to rely on our own ability to um, be in tune with the environment and really moment to moment find that clarity and regrounding. Um, there was a story 
um, I believe it was a, this, I didn't, I wasn't prepared to share this, but the um, Dalai Lama, I believe was the, the person um, this was about, but anyways, a spiritual teacher of, of great merit and somebody asked, you know, you never get knocked off center. You never seem like you're struggling. And I loved his answer because it wasn't no, yeah, I'm kind of evolved past struggling now. I've sort of transcended it. Uh, it was, no, I get knocked off center and I readjust so quickly now after practice that it looks seamless. Mm -hmm. And that at that time just stuck with me. And it became this curious, niggling inquiry of, I wonder what are those skills that allow us to be strong and center and also agile that allow us to adapt, but also know when to focus, that allow us to be so um, intelligently connected with our own intuition that, again, from the outside in, it looks like magic. It looks like never getting shaken when it's, there's a little more to it. I love where, where, where this has gone because I think – Honestly, when when we started having this conversation, when, when I talked to you about it, I hadn't even considered like what brand new territory everybody, or at least most people, are in, at least emotionally, if not in every other facet of their life. And even when you speak about training and these different skills, I could imagine being with you, like in the mountains, and you like reading the environment. And I think you said. There were a couple words that you freight that you used that I kind of want to dive a little bit deeper into and see if we can pull it back to like like what that looks like in the day to day. You said um, when the environment shifts, I see what remains, and I think that that in the context of like being in a wild frontier, that makes so much sense because let's imagine you get lost in the woods and you lose your backpack and. You don't have the resources that you thought you had. If you sort of just sat there and tried to like control your environment, you wouldn't last very long. And so to see what remained around you, this is at least how I heard it. Tell me if this is not correct. It would kind of allow you to readapt to what resources were in your space. And then you have to train and come back to center. Like, so I want to kind of dive into these elements of when, when, so I, I feel like the first kind of foundational piece that I really love that we're pulling out of the unknown is that the unknown doesn't necessarily have to be this insane, vague, nowhere, nothing space. It can be like a one step in front of you that's pulling you in an aligned direction. So I think the first question I, I have is um, how do we know how would one know that they were moving in an aligned direction that allowed them to embrace that the unknown was one step forward? Hmm. That's such a good question. I think there's a number of indicators that you are on that threshold of the unknown. I think one is an increased awareness that you're tolerating things. You're tolerating things that are not aligned. Uh, you're carrying forward pieces of your life or your career that are slowly draining uh, the life out of you. And, or you find yourself really in a place where in certain areas, maybe not the whole of your life, but you're just going through the motions. Um, there might also be a sense where you know you're avoiding something that just scares the crap out of you. And so toleration and fear, anxiety, limitation, these actually become the gateway to expanding and developing. That's one gateway. Now, there might also be something that you just truly desire to express or create in the world. One of my favorite conversations with somebody before they're a client is when they tell me, so I kind of want to create this thing and I don't know if I can, and I don't think it exists in the world. What do you think? 
Now they may be a little concerned and worried and af- and afraid, but I, I just, that's where I roll up my sleeves and say, this is fun. Let's get to work. And um, I, I, so I think there's a magic to fear that we underrate because we want so badly not to experience it. We, as soon as we feel a discomfort, we want to back away. Um, yoga, the physical practice of yoga and even weight training in the gym, whatever, but I really felt this at first in yoga where there's a difference between uncomfortability and absolute shutdown, damaging terror. And so when somebody is wanting to expand or they're feeling like absolute shutdown terror, my first step is really to back them away from that and to realize it's not push them harder uh, or try to like shove them through that door of expansion Um, But it's really to start breaking it down and making it a little bit smaller. It's a doable discomfort. And so you asked about daily practices. There's a number of ways um, that we can we can do this. But one of the pieces is to do courage racks. And I borrow this actually from conversations with um, my husband's former military, my brother's former military. So I have these people in my life. And I'd ask them, I'm like, how do you train courage? Because when you're in like a true life or death, you don't have time to think about like, I'm going to will myself to be more courageous and and will and bold. So, um, I, and they said, well, we train daily where they would do these courage racks where it would just be one aspect of their life where it felt uncomfortable and they were willing to step into it anyways. Um, They were willing to speak up. They were willing to not speak up. They were willing to get up earlier, um, you know, 3.30 and stand there and not complain, right? Just be. And so that can be a really fun way for people to practice. I'm not advocating going and doing something dangerous, but look, if you live in a cold climate, the cold is the perfect example of this. Notice how much you complain, avoid, armor up against cold. And notice if there's a connection between those patterns of armoring up and avoiding and complaining and trying to get out of it and anything else in your life where you're feeling limited. Mm-hmm. Those might reveal a tell. And then you can start to practice in a really fun way. What is it like to drop your shoulders when it's absolutely freezing out? Because look, I'm I, I'm not a big cold fan. But what's it like to really open the chest, to really bring an open heart, to feel all of the cold? And it's ver- it's it'll be really fun for people to see what they notice about themselves and then really the hidden gifts in that. I know one for me this last year, I was outside, it was super cold, right? But I dropped my shoulders, opened and kind of leaned in to the absolute freezing dark. And I noticed that there was like these very subtle like snow sprinkles down on my face. And it was just this beautiful moment of like, this is a gorgeous moment that I absolutely would have missed had I been all wrapped up in the discomfort. So that is one really practical piece. And then when someone's in business or relationship or expansion, you can start to look at how you can apply that same shoulders down, open heart, willing to experience it and step into just the next doable action. Does that answer your question, Vanessa? So much better than I could have ever asked it. Um, I love so many parts of that. So first, I love this again, just that, the analogy that you gave, it's not about that pushing so far that you're completely shutting down because I really think that we've sort of been indoctrinated into this, like get comfortable with being uncomfortable, which is fine, but it kind of gets pushed to this extreme where if it doesn't feel bad, it's not far enough. Mm -hmm. I love that you kind of walked that back a little and said, no, it's just, it's just far enough. It's doable. I I think that's a beautiful phrase. It doesn't have to technically scare you into shutdown. So I really love that. And then I think what I'm beginning to see more and more about 
do is that you're you're magician at cross training. This sort of is the word that comes to mind. You brought in yoga. You brought in the military, the courage racks, the wilderness. You ha you have such a it's such a beautiful way to frame the unknown in these really tangible, practical ways. Because as you get resourceful in the wilderness and you do these courage racks in your life and these, I mean, I think probably anybody watching this can think of five or 10 places in their life where they're avoiding feeling fear, complaining, resisting, pulling back from that. They, if they, if you sat for a second, you'd know exactly how to lean into that. Whether it's a comfortable conversation, sitting down and actually looking at your finances, you know, like there's something in here where you're, you're laughing, yeah. <laughs> Um, where you could do that. And as you build that um, muscle, I guess, so to speak, as you train, and I think that's what I love so much about you and what you're creating in the Dark Horse Initiative. You're actually pulling people into physical training to prepare them to embrace the, the unknown of what they're here to create. Yeah. And cross training is the perfect word. I, I don't think I had applied that um, mentality. So I had my own aha here in this conversation, but it is, it's like, um, when someone's training and this is really a part of this vision in, in what we do in the dark horse is that well, I may ask them to do a breath exercise, to do something about bouncing focus, to do, um, make a shape with their body and their posture, walk with something, uh, You'd have to ask my clients uh, whether they sometimes think I'm crazy or that that's pointless or whatever, but it's really this cross training of when we're working with an area that's uncomfortable, if we take the components of it, of what are they going to need to um, have on hand? What are those skills? Uh, what are those abilities, the, the strength? And then we can break those down, apply them in a different way to train. They have those to fall back onto next time they're challenged in the area they're trying to grow. Because when we encounter challenge, we always fall back to our current highest level of training. And, and so when we're, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I love um, when when we encounter challenge, we always tend to default back to our current highest level of training. Do you know what I thought you were going to say? And I'm so glad you did it because now I learned something amazing is I thought you were going to say when we encounter challenge, we always fall back on our current perception of who we are. And I this is what I love so much about you you turn everything into skill and training. You depersonalize. Um, like I could never imagine your husband going into like some precarious situation in the military and falling back and going, well, I guess I'm just not cut out for the military. You know, like you, you couldn't do that, which is kind of, I think what I do and a lot of people can do when we bump up against the challenges that are inherent in the unknown. Yeah, yeah. and that's where I, I think that I've started at a really honest place. Um, and I think that's why I became so curious to study it and tinker with it and explore and experiment and really build a different viewpoint around who we can become and break it down to skills and trainability and practice. It becomes really accessible at that, at that point. And then there's going to be skills and abilities and traits that you may start practicing and then realize, no, I, did, I, I don't think I wanted those anyways. It doesn't serve like your current direction or current project. And um, But this came from an honest place because when I began, I was so defined by personality labels. And I'd like to have other people to blame, but it really it's the labels I put on myself that really caged me, muzzled me, and really told me, nope, this is all you are really able to be. This is your capability. And um, I remember feeling so helpless in that. And there's almost an existential depression that I guess that's all that is here for me. So I just do my thing, 
and hope for the best and um, just kind of wait till uh, I die. And I'm sure there's like happiness along the way, hopefully. Mm-hmm. And um, when the truth of it is that we're completely free, we're completely free to develop beyond those labels. We're completely free to keep the labels that empower us and set us free. Um, We're completely free to express all of our gifts and abilities. And I just think that becomes a game changer. I totally agree. And I really, 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 really love that. One thing that I and kind of want to, there's one more question I have for you. But one thing I want to kind of define before we get into that last question is, I think we you we over uh, at least I do I overestimate. I think or let me underdefine is maybe the better word. What it actually means to say I put labels on myself because I think like we live in the personal development world, so I totally understand what you mean. But how does somebody who's never even heard that language before? How do they know if they're putting a label or a limitation on themselves? Oh, so good. So juicy. I can always count on you to break it down, make it even more practical. Um, I think if they listen to themselves. Say more about that. If they heard themselves saying, I can't because. Or that's not really me because. Or um, that's just not the kind of person that I am. Now, they're, of course, able to own any one of those. There may be some truths to this, right? Like, I would say I'm not the kind of person to be the life of the party when I walk in. And like, yeah, that's a label and that's a, that's a limitation at some level. But I haven't really needed to be the life of the party. And, and so it hasn't really rubbed me in a limiting way. It's, it's just neutral at this point. So a limitation, it's not necessarily that it can't be true or have truth to it. It's just that, is that because holding you back or pushing you forward or neutral where it becomes? Yeah. Like I would like to do this, or I wish I could express this, or I wish that I could be free of this, but I can't because. Got it. When we start to look at like the because, like what's the truth of it and not, I love that you said it, it could actually be true at that moment in their lens, but is it universally true, set in stone, not able to budge? Mm -hmm. That becomes a, a fun discovery. I love that. Thank you for defining that. And this kind of goes along with the part And and I I find it really useful to frame things in opposites. Like what is magic? What is your magic trick, right? And we got into the practical element of the magic here. My final question for you is what is what I kind of started to relate to the dark magic. And what I mean by that is what is the opposite of what we've talked about to you? Mm, I I love when you use the word dark magic because... It's to me like um, an electrical cord that's been unplugged from the source. And mm-hmm. so the light goes dark. And then it try it, let's just personify the light. It tries to do all of these finagling, manipulative, control-esque tricks to, um, to try to generate that same level of power and impact and influence or even just peace (laughs) in the world. And so for me, um, the opposite, so light magic, there's an attunement to that. And this was a piece of um, the Path to Possibility journal Um, that I wrote, but I wanted to give some, I wanted to give a tool for somebody to be able to practically attune each morning or whenever they do it to source, to the source of um, really, it's like the universal creation source. We might call it the divine, right? But like, it's this consciousness that is light 
um, loving, truthful, direct. It's, it's not just a hippy dippy out on a cloud. Um, agile, crazy smart, like in a wise way. Um, so that we start to notice the difference between attuned, out of tune. And dark magic for me is out of tune, like dissonant. Mm -hmm. It just feels off. Mm -hmm. um, something doesn't sit right. It feels heavy or constrictive or just bad, just bad. So, um, and when we apply this in a really practical way to business, it's really fun to start to look at the things, whether it's sales or marketing or financial systems where people associate it historically with dark, dark magic and like just a bad, yucky, manipulative, controlly feeling. But then what if we plugged it into source where it's actually loving, is actually filled with joy uh, there's a piece to it and a flow. Um, it, I don't know that that contrast uh, between light and dark is um, has been really game changing and revolutionary for me. I love the way that you frame that in terms of like one feels good and one feels bad. And I, I think I'll just um, ground that a little bit if I can sort of for myself and in, in just like a slightly different language is because I think that when, sometimes when people hear source, they just think God, which is in a way what you mean, but I'm also experiencing what you mean is like a tr like an inner knowing. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of people are so disconnected from that inner knowing that they might tell themselves they actually don't know. And but, so what I love is how you frame that in like, when we're using dark magic, we're doing all this finagling and manipulating and trying and controlling. We're like, there's this easy, loving path that like this feels bad and this feels good. And I, and I love that you brought that simplicity to it. Because yeah. And if I can just tag in one piece around good and bad, there's a distinction that I want, you know, you or, but really anybody listening as well. Um, there's a, a uncomfortable good and an uncomfortable bad. So there's an, a little bit of a difference because I'll see that intuition gets kind of a bad rap sometimes. Well, my intuition told me that I can't um, or, you know, that other way felt too struggly. So I didn't do it. Um, we want to really become so good at reading ourselves that we can say it's uncomfortable but also still feels liberating or daring or fun or freeing um, versus uncomfortable because it's fundamentally off for me. It's not aligned. Um, so I did want to add that in so that no one ever hears this as like only ever live the easy life and take the path of least resistance and never challenge yourself. Um, that wouldn't be a very fun, fun time. It reminds me of a quote that I read a couple of years ago, which is if you find a path with no obstacles, it probably doesn't lead anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. I, I figured you knew that. <laughs> so thank you. I, I love that kind of, I, I love that kind of framing the opposite that way, because I think that, I don't know, for me, that really kind of rounds out the whole picture. Um, I guess my final question for you, why well, I said final for the last one, but my final question really, is there anything else that you want to share about sort of using this, embracing the unknown to create magic, or even just a story you want to share to end where you have experienced either yourself or with a client, somebody who fully embraced the unknown and found some magic on the other side? Yeah, I think the piece I'd leave people with is willingness, this open um, I can think of a number of clients, but I'm thinking of one in particular where the place where she began her whole transformative adventure, uh, was I'm willing to take a look. I'm just willing to take a look. And there was, there's a gracious humility to that, that anyone listening if they're starting to awaken to the fact that they're carrying around a lot of 
tolerations and junk or they're living in a really small box and it's not working for them anymore because if that works more power to them um but it's not working and they'd really like to see what else is out there what i wonder what i could create or develop or expand um just start by being willing to take a look willing to take and you're my gal for this but willing to take a look at the uncomfortable truths of what's not working have a safe person a safe space where you can share the unacceptable ugly frustrations that you've been pushing down and repressing so that as you clear what you don't want and you share what you don't want anymore you're starting to open up to the possibility of what you might want that's where i would start oh that's amazing what i i, I don't even have anything to say i just love that so much the possibility of what you might want i love that even into the unknown like even even in the unknown even your desire can exist in the unknown. So I really love that. Um, thank you so much. Oh, we could continue on this conversation for hours. I, I. I know we could. So um, just share where where can people find you? Where can they engage with you? Um, yeah, one of the best places uh, is my direct email. But what I might also say here is um, if if people want to experience some of what we you and I have talked about, if they go to the path to possibility journal uh, dot com, so it's all one word, the path to possibility journal dot com, um, they'll they'll see a number of what we talked about with the unknown. They'll see a link. You can purchase the journal. It's on sale right now, which is great. It's a dropped price for accessibility. But really, you can also email me through there. And that's what I really want people to know. Just send me an email. Um, I'm happy to um, hear what, you know, if they have any questions from what came up today. I know it can stir up a lot. That would probably be the best way um, to reach me directly. And then we'll kind of figure out what makes sense from there. Cool. Thank you. I have the journal. I love the journal. So we'll, we'll drop that in the comments so that people can access it easily. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, thank you, Vanessa. This was such a treat. I cannot wait to hear all of the lessons you learn about practical magic this year. Thanks, thank man. you so much for having me. Bye. Bye. <laughs>